Hey guys, it's Jamin from Game Show, just here at my office again. And uh, yeah, as we mentioned, we're trying to do a couple shorter things during the week to deal with newsy stuff that happens in and about the world of games. So for a lot of you, you've probably heard about this. Uh, Oculus VR, the company that creates the Oculus Rift that was recently acquired by Facebook, held their first ever developers summit in Los Angeles. It was called Oculus Connect. And in it, um, they had a bunch of developers there showing off new products, their talks, uh, and, but one of the big announcements was that there was a new prototype of the Oculus Rift that was released called Crescent Bay. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things I'm excited about um, with the new Oculus Rift coming down the pipeline, but um, also some of my concerns and fears as well. So on the plus side, I think one of the things I'm really excited about is this idea of presence, which Oculus CEO Brendan Uribe talked about, um, this idea that, um, that virtual reality is finally getting to a place where you feel like you're actually in a particular scenario. And I, I think that that's really important important because, well, there's always things I'd like to do in my real life that I'm never really going to get a chance to do. I'm probably never going <coughs> to race a NASCAR. I'm never going to climb Mount Everest. Uh, probably never going to, I don't know, perform surgery. These are all things that I can now live vicariously through the world of the Oculus Rift. And that's really, really exciting for me. Um, I think the other thing I'm really excited about is um, virtual reality and Oculus Rift has the potential to give a new face to the concept of escapism. Now, typically we tend to think of escapism as being a really negative term, and it's, um, it's something that's plagued games for quite some time, this idea that people play games to get away from real life. Dr. Jeremy Balenson of Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab has pointed out, the reality is, is that escapism as a concept has been around for a really long time. Um, oral storytelling traditions were designed to transport people from their current place and time to some other universe, uh, movies, books, all of these different forms of media are really designed to take us out of where we are right now. Um, this is something that uh, Nicholas Carr has alluded to in his amazing book, The Shallows, that the act of reading is this incredibly immersive experience. It's not necessarily passive the way that people often think about it, but it actually transports you to some other place. Um, that's why inner dialogue in books is so important, because you really get a sense that person is there talking to you. Um, and so I think that one of the potentials that we have with uh, with virtual reality is I think that maybe this idea that games are these escapist experiences won't necessarily be viewed as a bad thing. Um, this is an argument that um, Jay McGonigal, uh, the game designer who has done some amazing TED Talks, amazing well-received TED Talks, has talked about. Um, she spoke about it at the Game Developers Conference, specifically that there are two forms of escapism. There's self-suppression and there's self uh, self-expansion. Um, Self-suppression is like when we use escapism as a way to get away from our current problems, whatever they might be. Self-expansion is when we escape to have positive experiences, like travel, for example, travel for leisure. Um, so one way to think about it in the context of games is self-suppression is saying everything totally sucks, I'm going to play games to get away, versus self-expansion, which would lead you to say life is better when I have time to play games. I think the virtual reality has the potential to make that distinction way more clear in the sense that if I am escaping, quote unquote, to spend time um, looking at, I don't know, a beautiful sunset on the other part of the world or to go see Aurora Borealis, that I think people will understand that's a good thing um, versus if you're spending time, I don't know, engaging in really negative behaviors in virtual reality. I think it'll be easier for people to understand the distinction between those two realities. On to my fears. So I have two kind of big fears. Um, the first one is a little bit more straightforward and specifically around this idea of curation. Um, app stores in the past haven't really done an amazing job um, with curation. You saw Valve, who produces Steam, the digital distribution network, is trying to tackle this problem by creating Steam curators and re-envisioning their front page to uh, their homepage to make it easier for people to find good games. But that's not really the case uh, in most other places. Um, and I think one of the concerns that I have with virtual reality is that the worst case scenario in a poorly curated app store is that you waste time or maybe you waste money. In virtual reality, if you have a bad experience there, it could make you sick, um, it could be too scary or too intense or whatever it might be. So the effects are much more palpable. So obviously Sony has talked about wanting to curate their experiences for Morpheus and you know, I hope that you know, maybe Oculus moves in that direction. Um, the second big fear that I have um, coming out of this past weekend is a question of culture. Um, specifically whether or not Oculus is going to be a place for everybody. Well, this is a common concern with a lot of new technologies, but if virtual reality is going to be this, um, this total 
dominant experience, this kind of you know force to change the world, then everyone needs to have a seat at the table. One of the things that kind of bugged me about Akka's Connect is that there were over 30 speakers and there wasn't a single woman there. Um, you know, obviously Akka's gets to decide who they want to speak on stage and there weren't any women that were present. And I'm sure there are lots of, there, I'm sure they have lots of good reasons why that you know might be per se. Nonetheless, it does send a clear message to people who are developing for the Oculus Rift that certain types of people fit the frame uh, for Oculus. But there's actually like a more pernicious version of this, um, which was actually talked about in an amazing article by Microsoft researcher Dana Boyd. She wrote a piece for Quartz and the title was, Is Virtual Reality Sexist? Um, it's meant to be a provocative question, kind of link baity, but her answer is not one of, um, it's, not, it's not necessarily like an opinionated answer, it's one that's based on her own research into virtual reality in the 90s. So you should read the entire thing. I will link to it in the description along with some of the other references from this particular mini episode. But specifically she makes the point that army researchers in the past have looked in the virtual reality and found that women get nauseous more often than men do. And the reasons for that have to do with um, two different things that exist in virtual reality. The first one is this uh, is this concept known as motion parallax. And basically motion parallax means that like when you hold a coffee cup up in front of your face, uh, it, in your field of vision, it appears to be as large as like the Eiffel Tower, but your brain is able to make the distinction because it knows that the coffee cup is only you know, yay big or whatever. Um, but the other one is shape from shading, which again, super complicated, but it has to do with the way that your eye makes all these different micro movements to adjust to light. So Boyd's point was specifically that um, right now, virtual reality has fixed the motion parallax problem, but they haven't fixed this other problem of shape from shading, and it's that one that seems to affect women more acutely. She also goes on to say that she's not drawing a distinction, saying that this, you know, the research tells us that this is the case more, that this is an observation that has been made and deserves more research. And her charge is that if this is a potential issue, that women do get nauseous more often than men in virtual reality, then this is something that anyone who's working in virtual reality should be, um, should be willing to go out and fix. And there are precedents for this uh, in terms of bias, in terms of design. I'll, I'll link to a post in the description, one in which a woman talks about Apple's staircases at the Apple stores. The staircases are translucent, which is fine if you're a dude and you wear pants all the time. But if you're a woman and you wear a skirt, going up a glass staircase is not exactly going to be um, the most welcoming experience. You see it in photography, for example. Um, different types of racial biases have been built into the way that um, you know photo, uh, photographic lenses and the way that the film is created to capture lights and darks. Um, there's a great piece, I'll link to it, by Sarita McFadden where she talks about, as a photographer, wrestling with that reality, wrestling with the nature of film. So these types of biases can be baked into technologies and my hope my hope is that this isn't the case for virtual reality, but it is a concern that I have. Um, I do hope that virtual reality ends up being this place that's available for everyone. Anyway, that was what I was thinking about with Oculus Connect this weekend. Um, please hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe, and please let me know what are your what are the things you're most excited about with the Oculus Rift? What are the things that maybe you're really concerned about? And uh, I will see you all next week.